ಸರ್ವೋಪನಿಷದೋ ಗಾವೋ ದೋಗ್ಧಾಗೋಪಾಲನಂದನ ಪಾರ್ಥೋವತ್ಸ ಸುಧೀರ್ಭೋಕ್ತ ದುಗ್ಧಂ ಗೀತಾಮೃತ ಮಹತ್ As we enter into the 16th lecture in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita lecture series, today we're going to start Adhyay, meaning chapter 4. At the beginning of chapter 4, Shri Krishna Bhagavan is going to remind Arjun about Yog, that eternal connection that we have with God. And he's going to say, I'm going to tell you about eternal Yog. And I told this eternal Yog in the past to Surya Devta, Vivaswan. This is that eternal yog about the eternal connection we have with God. And as soon as Krishna Bhagavan explains this to Arjun, Arjun stops and he says, wait, wait, wait. How can you tell me that you told this in the past to Surya, the sun god? Because you and I are closely the same. We're almost the same age. So how did you tell this to someone ages ago? And Krishna Bhagavan laughs and he says, you and I have been born in various places, infinite times. You don't remember, but I never forget. And at that time, Sri Krishna Bhagavan tells Arjun perhaps the two most famous Sanskrit shlokas in all of Hindu Dharma. If you know them, you can say them along with me. Krishna Bhagavan tells Arjun, Yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, abhyuthanam adharmasya, tadatmanam srujam yaham, ಪರಿತ್ರಾಣಾಯ ಸಾಧು ವಿನಾಶಾ ಚ ದುಷ್ಕೃತ ಧರ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಥಾಪನಾಥಾಯ ಸಂಭವಾಮಿ ಯುಗೆ ಯುಗೆ ಇನ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಧರ್ಮ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಗಾಡ್ಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಬ್ಲೆಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಗಾಡ್ ಹಿಮ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಇನ್ ಹೆವೆನ್ ದಟ್ ಸೇಮ್ ಗಾಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾಗ್ನಿಫಿಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಸ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೆರಾಕ್ಯುಲಸ್ ಪವರ್ಸ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಅರ್ಥ ಫಾರ್ ಈಚ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ Whenever we need Him, God will always be here. Whenever we're in need, God is only a prayer away. He will come down for each and every devotee. For one devotee, if it be, the way Prahlad prayed and Nursi Bhagwan came down for Him. In the same way, God is here for each and every devotee. Hindu Dharma strongly, firmly is rooted in this belief of Avtar Vat, that God comes down for each and every one of us. There's an anecdote to explain this. Once King Akbar asked his minister Birbal, he said, why does your Hindu god, Krishna, constantly come down onto this earth for each and every individual devotee? Why doesn't he just send someone else to do it on his behalf? Birbal said, I won't explain it to you. But over time, I'll show it to you. I'll show you why it does this. Birbal, in the meantime, he went to go meet one of the uh, statue makers in the kingdom. He told him, to make a statue as an exact replica, a model of King Akbar's grandson. King Akbar loved his grandson dearly. The statue maker made a small model. Birbal described the grandson to him. He had it painted and clothed to look just like the grandson. Then he took that model and he gave it to the man whose job it was to care for the grandson. And he said, I want you to go into the middle of the lake and wait for my cue. One day, Akbar and Birbal, they were passing by the lake. They saw the man in the middle of the lake. From a distance, Akbar and Birbal both saw that he was holding onto the grandson in his hand. Eventually, Birbal gave him the cue, and the man dropped the grandson into the water. King Akbar, without thinking, like a reflex action, jumped into the water, swam over there, and when he reached to grab his grandson, he found out it was just a replica. He gave it to the man, He helped, the man helped him back into the boat. They brought him to the shore. And Birbal asked King Akbar, Why did you jump into the water yourself? The man was there. You have so many other attendants here. You could have commanded anyone at any time to jump into the water and go and save your grandson. King Akbar said, It was a reflex action. I'm so much in love with my grandson. I didn't have time to think or to command anyone else. Birbal said, Remember recently you had asked me a question why Krishna Bhagavan comes on his own? for each and every devotee, this is why. Because to Bhagavan, each and every devotee, he loves them so much that when the devotee calls out to him, it's a reflex action. He doesn't have time to send anyone else. He comes out on his own. In Hindu Dharma, we are blessed that God comes for each and every one of us. Now in this couplet, Krishna Bhagavan explains that I come here to establish Dharma. We've explained in the past 
that that dharma isn't just varnashram dharma. It isn't just the general code of ethics in this world. It's that yoga, that eternal connection with God. Swarup nishta. Because people have lost their connection with God, comes back onto this earth to re-establish that connection. But Bhagwan Swaminan asks an interesting question based on these two couplets. In his scripture, the Vachnamrut, he asks his Paramahansa disciples that if God's only sole purpose for coming onto this earth was to re-establish dharma, or to also grant liberation to the souls, then couldn't he do those two things while still staying in heaven? The Paramahansa says, they respond, yes, of course, he's God. Because if you say that he can't establish dharma and liberate souls from heaven, then that shows a shortcoming in God. And if you say that he must come here for that, then that's not right. So then Bhagwan Swami Narayan explains, correct, God can do these things while staying in heaven and yet despite that he comes onto this earth. Why? What must be the reason? There must be something more than just that. The Paramahansa disciples, they don't have an answer and Bhagwan Swami Narayan explains that God comes onto this earth. He does come to re-establish dharma. He does come to liberate the souls. But one of the main purposes for God to come onto this earth is so that He can have a relationship with all of His devotees. So that He can love them here on this earth and give them an experience of bliss that they've never had from anyone else. If we look at God's life, Sri Krishna Bhagwan's life on this earth, we see everything He did was to have a connection with someone here. Krishna Bhagwan was born to Vasudev and Devki. If we go into how he was born, he was born in a jail. During his uncle's marriage procession, his parents, Vasudev and Devki, were there in the procession. And at that time, a voice from the sky prophesied that Vasudev and Devki's eighth child would be the one to kill Guns. Guns wanted to live so badly, Jiji Visha, that he took his brother in law and his sister and put them into jail. The same sister that once a year would tie a rakhri on his wrist, he took her hand and threw her in jail. Eventually, Vasudev and Devki had their first child in jail. Gans didn't think much of it because in his mind, he only had to fear the eighth child. But at that time, somebody told him that the world isn't in a straight line. Time, don't consider it linear. Consider it like a cycle. That right now, what you're considering the first child and then 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, what if God is considering it in reverse where the 8th is the first and then ends up becoming the 8th? And just from a little doubt, Guns was convinced. He realized that none of the children can live. He went into the jail cell, took the child, and in front of its mother and father, picked it by its feet and smashed it against a rock. The first child was killed like this, Eventually, a second child was born, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, six children, guns killed in this terrible way. The seventh child, before it was born, it was transferred by divine grace from the womb of Devki to the womb of Rohini, Karshan. And because it was pulled, that seventh child's name was called Sankarshan. And then, in the month of Shavan, Vasudev and Devki had their eighth child. That eighth child is Sri Krishna Bhagwan. As soon as the eighth child was born, picked it up into his hands. And as soon as he picked up Krishna Bhagwan in his hands, the jail cell doors opened. He exited out of the jail cell. He knew that he had one chance to save his child's life. He went to a river and the river made way for him. He walked through the river and he deposited that child in a different place in Gokur. When he put the child down, he picked up a replacement in his place called Yogmaya. As soon as he picked up Yogmaya, eventually he had to get back into jail. From the very first actions of Krishna Bhagwan's life, he's giving us some different lessons. Krishna Bhagwan was born in a jail. He was born in bondage so that he could free us. He was born at night in the darkness so that he could give us light. Vasudev, from the moment he picked up Krishna Bhagwan, he was free from all of his shackles. But the moment he put Krishna Bhagwan down and picked up Yogmaya, again, he was in bondage. Krishna Bhagavan is teaching us that as long as you have me in your hands, as long as you have me in your hearts, then you're free. But the moment you put me down, the moment you separate yourself from me, you'll be back in your chains. Krishna Bhagavan has come onto this earth to give us some sense of happiness. 
to give us the experience of God here on earth. Krishna Bhagwan lives in Gokur. He was born in Mathura. But we don't celebrate that he was born in Mathura because Mathura is Kansi's village. We celebrate his prakritya, his revelation in Gokur. In Sanskrit language, Go means Indriya, our faculties. And Kur means gathering. All of our faculties, the Upanishads say, gather in our hearts. When God is revealed in our hearts, that's the true revelation of God. That's why we celebrate God's prakritya in Gokur. Slowly, Bhagwan Sri Krishna is now living with Yashoda Mata. He's getting older. In the village, Krishna Bhagwan has these habits where he goes to different gopis' houses and he eats their butter. All of the different gopis, they all complain to Yashoda Mata that it's your son who's coming into our house and stealing our butter. Makhan Chor. But Yashoda Mata refuses to believe it because in her heart, she sees Krishna and every time she sees him, her heart melts. My Krishna, my Kanuro, he would never do anything like this. One day, Yashoda Mata is playing with Krishna Bhagwan in her lap. And at that time, Krishna Bhagwan raises his hands and he's hungry. As Yashoda Mata goes to feed Krishna Bhagwan, she realizes, she remembers that she set, left some milk on the stove. She puts Krishna Bhagwan down to go turn off the stove so that the milk doesn't overflow. And in that meantime, Krishna Bhagwan takes an opportunity. Krishna Bhagwan starts to just crawl on all fours to the butter gourd that's in their house, the pot of butter. He takes his own pot of butter, smashes it on the ground, takes whatever butter he can in his hands, and he makes his way to the window. Eventually, Yashoda Mata comes out of the kitchen and she sees that the butter gourd has been broken. The pot has been smashed to pieces. And there are these oily footprints and knee slides, all of these little, little stains on the ground. She follows them. And she goes to the window and she sees Krishna Bhagwan. Krishna Bhagwan is taking the butter and making little, little balls of butter, one into his mouth, one he throws out of the window to the monkeys and he's looking back constantly. And when he sees his mother, he puts his hand, oh, I've been caught. And his mother is vexed. Yashoda Mata says, all the gopis have been telling me for so long that you've been a makhan chor, you've been stealing their butter. I didn't believe that. But now I know for a fact, you are a makhan chor. And she decides that today she's going to teach Krishna Bhagwan a lesson. She takes a stick in her hand and she starts to chase Bhagwan. But Bhagwan Sri Krishna, he's a small boy at the time. How hard would it be for an adult to catch up to a small boy? But this is Bhagwan. The Ishopanisha describes the speed of God. Manasojariyo. God is faster than the mind can even contemplate. How can a human catch up to God? And here is Yashoda Mata with a stick in her hand. The stick represents anger and arrogance. As long as a person is arrogant, there is no way you can catch on to God. She can't catch God. She's trying to keep her sari all uh, arranged in one hand and with the other hand she's holding on to the stick. Eventually she throws down the stick and the moment she lets go of her arrogance, she's able to hold on to God. Who tare? Hari dukara. The moment you give up your arrogance, the moment we give up our sense of ego, God instantly is in our hands. Now she has God. She goes outside in the front of her house. And in old days, the front of every Indian person's house, they would have a mortar and pestle built into the ground. A large pestle, which is called a kal in Sanskrit. Khandanyu, sambelu in different languages in Indian culture. Now this will be a full-sized one, not a mortar and pestle, a small one that we might have at home in our kitchen today, but a full-sized one, maybe three or four feet tall. She takes Krishna Bhagwan near the pestle. She finds a piece of rope from her house and she decides that today, in front of the entire village, she's going to tie her son in the front to the pestle so that everyone can see that he's being disciplined. She takes the rope. In Sanskrit, rope is called dam. And she touches it to Krishna Bhagwan's stomach. In Sanskrit, stomach is called Udar. And the moment that Dham touches Udar, Krishna Bhagwan gets the name Damodar. She goes to tie the rope behind Krishna Bhagwan, but then she realizes that it's just two fingers too short. So she grabs another piece of rope from her house, ties the two pieces of rope together, and she goes to tie it behind Krishna Bhagwan. But again, it's two fingers too short. 
She gets a third piece of rope, a fourth piece of rope, a fifth piece of rope, and as many pieces of rope as she gathers together, every time she goes to tie it behind Krishna Bhagwan, it's two fingers too short. In Sanskrit, the word for rope is gurn. Here we are as people trying to tie and attach ourselves to God with different guns. Gun means virtues. Whether it be our intellect, the way we look, our strength, whether it be our talents, we keep trying to tie God, attach ourselves to God with our talents, our intellect, our skills. But every time we go to do it, we're going to be two fingers too short. Aham and mamatva. Arrogance and the sense of maya. Every one of our virtues has this dirt attached to it. It always comes with a little bit of maya. Eventually, Yashoda Mata realizes that there's no way for her to tie God in this way. So she gives up and she says, Hey Bhagwan, dear God, let me tie you. And when she takes full Sharanagati, complete refuge of God, and has no longer has any arrogance about any of her skills, talents, virtues, anything, at that moment, instantly the rope ties behind God. The moment we give up every other support we have, every one of our talents, skills, virtues, strength, everything else that we think is good enough for God, the moment we realize we'll never be good enough for God, it is only by God's grace that we can be attached to God in that very moment, that's when we can tie God. Vallabh Acharya, in his commentary in the Srimad Bhagavat about this story, he says, the people who perform austerities can see God. They get a vision. People with wisdom, gnan, they can recognize God. But only when you have complete devotion, complete refuge of God, like Yashoda Mata had at this point, can you actually attach yourself to God. In the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavat, Kunti Mata reminds Krishna Bhagwan of this story. And she says, envisioning you with tears in your eyes, tied to a pestle, at the front of your house. When I think of that story, Sa maam vimoyati bhirapi yat bibeti, I'm just in shock. I'm so amazed that fear itself manifest is afraid of you because you're God. If fear itself became manifest, it would run away from you. And here you are showing fear. How amazing is that? If we try to understand the way a person speaks, you have to hear multiple lectures. For those of you who have been listening from the first Gita lecture series up to today, you've gone through 15 until now. This is your 16th lecture. And by now, through 15 different lectures, you've understood my style of speaking. In the same way, we have to understand Vyasji's style of writing. In all of the scriptures, every time Krishna Bhagwan performs a miracle, for Vyasji, at the end of the miracle, it's as if it's nothing. For example, when Krishna Bhagwan saves Parikshit in the womb, after that miracle is performed, Vyasji just in passing writes, but how is this a big deal for God? Because God saves every person from the womb. But on the opposite spectrum, every time Krishna Bhagwan performs something very human-like, acts so simple, at that time, Vyasji, he writes something at the end to show us how amazing that is. Vyasji is amazed by the fact that someone so great can behave so small. Someone so powerful can show so much need to other people. This is Vyasji's style. In the same way, a devotee of God realizes that Manushya Bhav and Divya Bhav seeing the human-like actions of God and seeing the divine actions of God, they're not different. But in reality, the human-like actions of God are actually more important than the divine-like actions of God because everyone is always impressed when God acts divine. But only a true devotee is impressed and amazed when God acts like a human. We'll speak on this topic of God's divinity in the next upcoming lectures. But until then, back to the story. Yashoda Mata has left Krishna Bhagwan in this situation. To build this relationship, Krishna Bhagwan has to come onto this earth and act like a child in front of his mother. Krishna Bhagwan and Arjun, their relationship, Krishna Bhagwan describes that relationship using the word Sakha. You're my closest friend. When people are friends, they can open up with each other. That relationship 
that sharing of confessions and this sharing of knowledge between those two people is different than from anyone else. And we see that relationship through Arjuna and Krishna Bhagwan's incidents throughout the Mahabharat. In the Mahabharat, after Draupadi had been wed to five brothers, they took a vow amongst themselves that when Draupadi is staying with one of the brothers, the other brothers can no longer enter into that person's house without permission. One time, Draupadi was staying with Yudhishthir in Yudhishthir's palace. At that time, somebody came to Arjun and requested Arjun's help. Someone had stolen some goods from that person and they wanted Arjun to come and retrieve those goods. For that, Arjun needed to get his weapons, but his weapons were in Yudhishthir's palace. So now he was in a difficult situation. What to do? If I go into the palace, I've broken this rule. But if I don't go in to get my weapons, then who am I as a warrior if I can't protect the people? He decided, As Krishna Bhagavan has told him in the Gita, he already had that sense of self-respect that it would be better to break this rule amongst my family than to lose my reputation amongst the citizens of this kingdom. So he goes into Yudhishthir's palace, takes his weapons, retrieves the stolen goods, and then he comes back to Yudhishthir. He touches Yudhishthir's feet and he says, I broke the rule that we had amongst ourselves. You were with Draupadi alone in your palace, but I entered into the palace. And so now, as atonement for breaking the rule, I'm going to go and spend 12 years in the forest. Yudhishthir says, it's not a big deal. We weren't doing anything, so you don't need to go into the forest. But no, Arjun is firm in his mind. He says, I've already taken this vow. I've accepted it in my mind. I'm going to go for 12 years into the forest. I'll spend 12 years there and I'll follow the vow of celibacy while I'm there. So he goes into the forest. Throughout the Mahabharata, all of the Pandavas are exiled into the forest three times. Arjun has been exiled to the forest four times. This is the extra time that he alone has been exiled. While he's in the forest, he's going to be there for 12 years and he's taken a vow of celibacy. Eventually, he makes it to the place called Prayag. In Prayag, while he's in the river taking a bath, someone pulls his leg all the way down to the bottom of the river and he meets a woman by the name of Ulupi. Ulupi says, You're such a handsome man. I've fallen in love with you at first sight. I want you to marry me. Arjun says, I can't marry you. I've taken a vow of celibacy. Ulupi's already heard the vow and she says, That vow of celibacy only applies to your relationship with Draupadi. If you marry me, make me another wife, then that vow doesn't apply to us. And Arjun thought about it for less than a second and he said, this is a good loophole. I agree. And so he married Ulupi. And he stayed with her for one year and they had a child. That child's name was Iravan. We mentioned Iravan in the past. Iravan was the son that Arjun sacrificed to Kalimata at the beginning of the Mahabharat war with the Chandipat. After spending one year with Ulupi, Arjun continues traveling through the forest and he arrives in the village of Manipur. He sees a beautiful woman by the name of Chitrangana. Now he already has this loophole in his mind, so now he goes to the king on his own and he says, I want to marry your daughter. The king says, fine, you can marry her, but then I also want a son from her. So you have to stay. You can't just get married and leave immediately. He says, fine, I'll stay. He marries another woman, has another child. This is Arjun. He's taken a vow of celibacy. He's already been married twice and has two children. Towards the end of the entire exile, towards the end of the twelfth year, he makes his way to Gujarat, towards Girnar, and he meets Krishna Bhagwan and the Yadavs. They're happy to have somebody there, they're happy to receive Arjun, and they decide to go near Mount Girnar and have a picnic. So in the process, Arjun takes Krishna Bhagwan to the side. And because they're close friends, because they have this relationship, Arjun opens up to Krishna Bhagwan, and he tells him about all the mistakes that he's made. He tells him that I took this vow for 12 years and I've been in the forest but I've broken it in this many ways. And while he's talking to Krishna Bhagavan about this, he looks to the side and he sees this girl. Krishna Bhagavan sees that while Arjun is talking to me, he's looking at this girl. Krishna Bhagavan says, Do you know who this girl is? Arjun says, Yes. Krishna Bhagavan says, That's my sister, Subhadra. Why are you looking at her? Arjun can't even get the words out. Krishna Bhagavan understands. Krishna Bhagavan says, do you want to marry her too? Arjun says, huh? <laughs> he can't even say yes. He's so embarrassed. Krishna Bhagavan says, fine. But understand that the Yadavs here, they won't just let you take Subhadra. They won't give you her hand in marriage. You're going to have to do something else about it. 
Arjuna says, what do I do? How do I defeat the Yadavs? Krishna Bhagavan says, let me tell you how. And he gives him a method. He says, you have to take your chariot, drive past everyone, and as you're driving past, just grab Subhadra, pull her into your chariot, and ask her directly to marry you. Don't ask anyone else's permission. Apahara and viva. So as they're going out into this picnic, all of a sudden, all of the Yadavs, they see white horses coming towards them. Subhadra is amongst her brothers and they see these white horses and they feel that this must be Krishna Bhagwan's chariot because Krishna Bhagwan's chariot has white horses in the front. But as the chariot is getting closer and closer, it's coming so fast, they can't really make out who it is. And eventually, when it gets too close, they see that it's Arjun. And the moment they realize it's Arjun, it's too late. Arjun has grabbed Subhadra by the hand, pulled her into the chariot, and he's riding off. The Yadavs, for a moment, they're just stuck. What just happened here? Balram is vexed. He tells the Yadavs, everyone grab your chariots. Everyone get into your chariots. Let's chase after Arjun. Let's grab him. He's taken our sister. Krishna Bhagwan says, but what's the rush? Krishna Bhagwan starts to delay the Yadavs. He says, what's the rush? If you go after Arjun, he's already asked Subhadra's hand in marriage. By now it's already over. I'm more than ready to understand that she's agreed to it. Balram said, even if she agrees to it, that's not the right way to do it. He should ask our permission first. Krishna Bhagwan explains, Arjun is a good guy. Subhadra is a good girl. And if this is a good relationship between the two of them, who are we to stand in their way? Let's just let it happen. We should be happy with the whole situation. Balram says, I'm not against the marriage. But I do want to grab Arjun and smack him around a bit so that he knows, he learns his lesson. Krishna Bhagwan says, you can try to reach Arjun, but you won't reach him. What do you mean I won't be able to reach Arjun? You have your chariot and on your chariot are the fastest white horses in the entire kingdom. Krishna Bhagwan says, that's my point. What point? Okay, I don't have my chariot. That was my chariot. Arjun is using my chariot with my horses to take our sister. Krishna Bhagwan gave his chariot with his horses to Arjun so that nobody could catch him. This is the relationship they had, Sakha. They were best friends. And because they were in that relationship, Krishna Bhagwan quite often reminds Arjun throughout the Gita, because you are my best friend, I am giving you this knowledge. When we have that relationship with God, where we can tell God anything we want, even if it's worldly, and God can tell us anything He wants us to know, even if it's bitter medicine like the Bhagavad Gita, that's when we have a full connection, that yoga with God. This is why God comes onto this earth. So to build and establish a relationship with all of us. And in the process, when we have that eternal connection with God, through friendship, through family, through this love, then naturally it leads to our liberation. At the end of this session, I like to pray that whoever our God is, whoever our Guru is, that we build that relationship with them. We build that love with them. And when we have that open connection with them, they'll be open enough to give us their internal wisdom, their most divine and secret wisdom. Astu.